Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Resetting the Stage, a conversation about the past, present, and the future of casting practices in Canada. My name is Jamie Robinson. I am an actor, director, and professor at York University's Department of Theatre, and I will be your co-moderator for today's event. I'm very pleased to be here today with my co-host, Dante Jamont. And that's me. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dante Jemmet. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from York University's Acting Conservatory program, and uh, today I'll be co-moderating with Jamie for the first of three panels over the next two days with professional theatre playwrights, directors, and actors from within the Ticoronto community. With our theatres being shuttered and having had the chance to slow down and reflect on the events and protests of only a year ago, these conversations over the next two days will be a gathering of ideas that we anticipate will shed some light on what we hope the future stage can and should look like from the casting process and beyond. This is also an opportunity for theatre students to learn how the legacy of harmful casting practices in Canada can provide healthy insights to affect change today and in the future, both within training institutions and in the professional world. Now, education is at the heart of these discussions. And as we begin to pass on these learnings to the next generation of artists, we feel that it's just as important to continue to learn about the land on which we reside. And with that, our gathering here on Zoom is transmitted from the headquarters in San Jose, California. And we'd like to acknowledge that the territory sits on the land of the Olohone and the Muekme Olohone people, who trace their ancestry through the missions of Dolores, Santa Clara, and San Jose. In addition, we recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which the campuses of York University stand and on the land which we currently reside upon. We acknowledge that we are visitors to the area known as Ticoronto, where we share our stories, which has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the ancestors of Petun and Neutral Nations. We also acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Sp uh, Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. It is our hope that this agreement from the past can help educate us in the present to ensure a true sharing and caring of our stories on this, this land for the future. So in light of the recent horrific news coming from Kamloops, BC, about past extreme harms done to children in residential schools. We'd like to offer you now a couple of links to donate um, to the Legacy of Hope Foundation or the uh, Indian Residential Schools Survivor Society and uh, York University's own uh, resources for Indigenous students and staff and faculty. Please take a moment now to click and consider using these li links uh, for donations or otherwise and perhaps discover another that resonates for you, wherever it is that you may be residing. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, before we begin, please note that due to the nature of today's discussion, some things might be stressful to hear. We ask that you be open to listening, but also be aware of your own comfort level as we gather here in your space and in the personal spaces of our guests today. Do please note that the closed caption button is available at the bottom of your screen, which you can always click uh, to gain access and that there will be a 20 minute question and answer period at the end of our one hour panel discussion. You can type questions below at any time, which will only be seen by us, the moderators. And we'll get to as many of them as we can before the end. The chat function will not be available. And finally, we'd like to acknowledge the financial support from the Department of Theater, a Shirk Exchange Knowledge Mobilization Grant and the York Research Chair in Theater and Performance History. And we'd also very much like to thank Mary Pekia, Thomas Sayers, and our entire curatori curatorial team working behind the scenes, who we will reveal to you all at the proverbial curtain call at the end of today's event. Yes. <laughs> and with that, let's get started by introducing today's artists. Today's panel will be discussing the legacies of historical casting practices. We'll paste their full bios in the chat for you to access. So we'd like to introduce first Carmen Aguirre, Carmen is an award-winning theater artist and author. She's the core artist at Vancouver's Electric Company Theater and artistic associate of new play development at the Stratford Festival. And next is Walter Borden. Walter holds the Order of Canada and the Order of Nova Scotia. 
and is an internationally acclaimed African-Canadian Mi'kmaq actor, poet, and playwright, and a nationally recognized activist and teacher. Jani Lazon is a multidis multidisciplinary, multi-award winning and nominated artist of Métis ancestry, and is currently the Associate Director of English Acting at the National Theatre School of Canada. Bea Pisano. Bea is a multi-award winning and nominated actor, director and playwright and founder and artistic director of Aluna Theatre recognized for its experimentation with multi-language productions. Kimberly Rampersad is a Dora Award nominated actor, director, choreographer and current associate, associate artistic director of the Shaw Festival in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario. Welcome and thank you all for being here today. Okay, we're going to start right away with one question that we're going to be asking uh, all three panels over the next couple of days. Uh, and I'm gonna give each of you a, a, um, an opportunity to speak on this. Um, and the question simply is, what challenges have you specifically faced in your practice, uh, whether as an actor, director, producer, or creator, where casting is concerned? And I wonder if there's anybody who'd like to speak to that first. <laughs> can start well, yes Jenny thank you yeah um <clears throat> so I, I think uh I've told this story many times so I'm sure that some, some of you have heard it but you know maybe it's maybe it's good that these kinds of things are, are repeated but early on in my career I was very interested in um Shakespeare and I grew to love Shakespeare through my foster father who also loved Shakespeare and we read his plays around the dinner table and analyzed them and talked about them and and I left thinking that it was possible because in the Shakespeare productions that we did in high school uh, was very multicultural casting um, and out in the real world then I went because this is in the 70s and that late, late 70s I was like whoa wait a minute the world doesn't think like my foster father did and so I uh, was interested in training more and I went to take a class and I was told that I was more than welcome to take the class but that I would never work as a Shakespearean actress and so that kind of um, response actually uh, has helped me in my career in an odd sort of way because I, I have spent my my career trying to prove them wrong and uh, so those kinds of incidences are, um, are uh, while sad but true, have actually been the fire that was lit under my butt uh, to get involved and to try to advocate for change within the industry. Thank you. And I agree. While we were chatting. Those are worth, worth repeating. Yes, Walter. <laughs> While we were chatting there before the program, before we started, someone made the statement that, uh, you know, we're in a very long uh, conversation. And uh, that uh, kind of rippled through my head because I thought, uh, yeah, I've been in this conversation for 60 years. And then uh, I thought to myself, you know, actually, no, 66 years. Uh, in 1954, I was in grade six. I was 11 years old. I did my first little stint on stage. It was a Christmas show. I was playing uh, a town crier. And uh, um, judging from the results, I guess I, I town cried pretty well. So the next year, that'd be 1954, I'm in grade seven now, and I'm 12 years old, and it's November, and they decided that they were going to cast for the Christmas show. And because I had gained a little kind of a uh, reputation for being able to speak well in class, because we had to do those uh, oral compositions, my English teacher sent me off to do an audition. Now the role was for Santa Claus in the upcoming Christmas play. And on this particular day, I was the last one called in for the audition and I go into the auditorium and I did my little thing. Now, uh, the teachers were around a table and the ta around the table, there was a screen. 
And after I had done my little audition um, and was sent back to my classroom, I had to run to the washroom instead. So I did that. And when I left the washroom to come back, I had to cross in back of the screens that protected the teachers so that I could get out of the exit door. And as I was going on behind them, I heard teacher say, well, yes, yes, Walter was really the best, but, well, it is the role of Santa Claus. I had never had anything said to me that would have prepared me for the instant feeling that I had, because without anybody saying anything, I knew exactly what they meant. Exactly. Now, I never forgot that because, it, you know, I had to think about it many times, many times over the years, naturally, um, especially since the conversations that we're having today, really and truly, I had 60 years ago and 70 and, and, and then 50 years ago and then 45 years ago and then 30 years ago. Uh, so, and I do not say that uh, deprecatingly, I just say it because, uh, it makes me aware of, uh, because someone said while we were talking earlier too, uh, something to the, effect, to the effect that memories are short. Indeed, they are. Indeed, they are. Doesn't stop me from doing what I have to do, but memories are very short. And, they're, and, and we can probably talk about this later, but the reasons that they are short is because they are allowed to be short. That's all. <laughs> Walter, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, memory is quite short. And, and uh, Jenny, I, I mean, we've known each other for a long time and it's like, Rage has been what has gotten me here. Um, I've always produced my work. I started in Vancouver, theater. I, of course, I work on film and TV where I was killed in every episode. Uh, you know, we know what, what I was playing. Let's, I don't have to go there. Um, but I arrived in Toronto and I really, really wanted theater. And uh, I started auditioning and they would say to me, um, we love your work, but we don't know what to do with someone like you. So someone like me is very specific because I think uh, we can talk about a lot of changes, but I still represent the one last frontier is I have an accent. Thank God for it, even though I don't believe in God. But um, uh, that has made me the person that I am. So I decided, well, if nobody's going to hire me, which I don't think it has changed that much. I'm a playwright, actor, director. And if I don't create my work, you know, now slowly people are saying, you know, in the last year with things seeming to change, you know, it's starting to get phone calls because let's have some diversity. Uh, but um, that has been the best thing I had to do in my life was create my own company and uh, make sure that I was going to work and I was going to make the decisions and I was going to create the pieces I want to create. Because when I think about what diversity is for me, it's not, it's not the color of his skin. Is, is how we ch tell stories. And I am so tired that there's only one way of telling stories that they tell, especially in English Canada. And I am a presenter because I, I produce a, an international festival and I see a lot of theater around the world and people are not afraid to have accents on stages where uh, in, in countries where many languages are spoken, you know, it's like, this is a uh, theater is not what we see here. There's many ways of approaching this story. So um, if we're gonna talk about changes, we have to talk. I am so tired of saying that because you put a, a brown skin that you have done the deed, you know? So if we're gonna talk about change, let's talk about change. But I think one of the beautiful things, most of the, my colleagues that I see is like people uh, who have all had to create their work because nobody was going to do it, you know? And uh, here I am with an accent and a woman. So we know that that in itself is already, <laughs> is already a challenge, but, but uh, I love the, the rage, did, and, but I also hope that the future for other generations is not, is, it looks different than it looked for me. That's it. I can go. 
hermana Latina. <laughs> um, I'm joining you from uh, unceded Squamish territory, um, also known as downtown Vancouver. I'm two blocks away from uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery where there is a shrine, a living shrine for the 215 children who were found um, wearing my orange. Um, and I come from uh, Latin America, from Chile, Walmapu, Latin America, Abiyala in the Guna language. Uh, I am not a settler, I am a refugee. I did not come here to um, take anybody's land or um, exploit people. My relationship to this land is that I am a refugee and I am a visitor and I was expelled forcibly from my land, uh, Chile. So uh, thank you so much for having me and it's just incredible to hear the others speak. Uh, I think we all have the same stories and, and speaking of memories, I would really love to acknowledge that uh, to, to all the young people who are here with us today, that the, all of us who are here speaking and many others have been in this struggle for decades. Um, it's not a new struggle. And I think it's really important to acknowledge um, that where we are right now, even having this conversation right here right now is thanks to all the work that all of us elders have done for the last few decades. It wasn't that long ago when we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Um, you know, in the 1990s, so I've been in this struggle for 31 years. And uh, in the 1990s, um, I would very openly use words like systemic racism in the theater. And uh, I was blacklisted in the 90s, you know, and probably in the 2000s as well. <laughs> um, I would hear all the time that I wasn't being hired because people were afraid of my views. Uh, even though I go out of my way as one has to when one is a woman of color to be extra professional in the rehearsal hall, right? To do double the work and behave impeccably in the room, that didn't matter. What mattered was that my views were considered radical and that I might uh, cause a stir in the rehearsal hall. So I had to create my own work or starve. Uh, my, my journey with this whole thing began uh, six weeks into theater school. I, um, I, I was nodding my head at you, Jani, when you said you've told this story before. I've told this story before, but I think it's important to tell it again. <laughs> um, so I was uh, six weeks into theater school in 1990, and I was called into the office by the faculty. There were uh, three uh, students of color in the entire student body. And uh, of course, an all white faculty and every single playwright we were studying was uh, a white man, most of them dead. Um, and I was called by the faculty into the office and I was uh, told that if there was anything else I wanted to do with my life that I should do it right now, that I should leave and, and, and do it right now because it's a racist business. I'm a Latina woman and I will not get any work at all. And if I did get any work, it would be playing hookers or maids. Uh, now, like my first shock was, oh shit, they can tell I'm Latina and that I'm brown. Fuck. I wish, like, I, 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 thought, I thought they hadn't noticed that detail. That's too bad. Um, and then uh, I was like, uh, basically I said, no, I'm staying. Thanks very, thanks. You know, I'm staying and I'm actually going to teach you about racism. So thanks for that. Um, and they were absolutely right, of course, like the amount of hookers I played, not anymore because I'm too old, is long. And um, uh, the only times that I've been on the major stage here in Vancouver was playing maids. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I could go on here. So I was very um, happy that my teachers told me that because it forced me to uh, create my own work, right? And to tell stories that I, I didn't see were being told uh, on Canadian stages. Uh, so that's what I started to do. Um, and, you know, it, it's an ongoing um, problem as we all know. Uh, so that happened 31 years ago. I could tell you a million other stories like that. Um, I'll tell you one, which is quite recent which is that I crashed on audition. <laughs> this is in the theater. I crashed on audition because there were a bunch of 
uh, roles for women my age in this play. And I was like, I'm just gonna crash this audition. So I went and I crashed it. And of course I prepared for it, right? And I looked at the names on the board and uh, this is one of the major theater companies in Canada. And every single name on the board was a white person. I was, oh, for fuck's sake. Anyway, so I crashed the audition. I forced myself into the room. I do the audition. And then that night I get a phone call saying, oh, thanks. Yeah, we loved your audition, but you just don't fit in with the rest of the family. <laughs> and this is quite recent, right? This is not 30 years ago. This is not 20 years ago. This is not 10 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought I would just bookend the, the story from theater school with this other one and I'll stop for now. Thank you, Carmen. <laughs> and Kimberly, you are the last one. All right. Um, hey, y'all. Thanks for having me with you. Uh, my name is Kimberly Rajkumari Ramprasad. I'm coming to you from the mouth of the Niagara River and, we're, and Lake Ontario. Uh, my parents, June and Jerome, immigrated from Trinidad and Tobago to uh, Muddy Waters, also known Treaty One, Winnipeg, and a meeting of another most important waters, the Red and the Assiniboine, the home of many nations, including the Métis Nation, a nation unto themselves, but also mixed. And I uh, feel a strong affinity for them as a mixed race person, South Asian and Black. So I just wanted to position myself in this world and tell you how grateful I am to speak to you about this beautiful thing that, um, be, that all of our traditions have of storytelling, of teaching through stories, of teaching through experiencing and through the word and through elders uh, passing on this wisdom. Um, my <laughs> challenges in the arts as both an actor and as a director come from other people's limitations in particular, that then present themselves as obstacles for me. I know certainly as an actor, I have been told we, you wouldn't be considered. I wouldn't be considered because the way they imagine a part is not with a black or brown woman and they don't want to consider it as something else. I couldn't be considered or that I shouldn't be considered. And that has nothing to do with my ability or how I show up. And that there is that vibration of showing up very excellent and our parents telling us these things. I think I'm lucky that my parents taught me to show up to be excellent, not in response to other people underestimating me, but as a response to being their child. And I only share that because that my excellence um, for almost most of the time comes from joy and joy for me is sustainable it's contagious and that's where the revolution is. So if your parents are giving you that math and that's some good math, you know, twice as good for half the pay for a quarter of the opportunities or whatever the algorithm of your household is. But if you can make sure that that comes from joy, I think that that is uh, sustainable and it can regenerate itself. So I think that that was really important of what my parents uh, taught me in terms of the art. I think I've had challenges beyond once you get into the room from my colleagues, uh, some of them thinking that I was there for other reasons other than being excellent going into fittings and not looking like some of the people that have been traditionally in a lot of the theaters where I work, where I walk with what I call my heritage, my bottom, and that it is full because I'm a black and brown girl. And that a lot of these costumes that are built that I need to fit into don't look or don't accommodate all of that goodness. And I'm told about it, but not in a beautiful way. I'm told about it. Those are challenging things. Uh, honestly, the idea that it's still an issue that I can't get things dyed in my in the color that is necessary for me for what nude is and what nude is presented to me, that I have to cry and beg for mic, mic cords still. Like I was a surprise that I was cast a year ago and that I showed up with this color skin. These are phenomenal things that I'm given wigs that look so silky smooth, like I'm a Barbie doll. And I'm like, well, listen, if that's the story we're telling, but a lot of the time it's not, I'm, my character is not pressed. So then where are my kinks and coils? Where are all of these things? They are not taken into consideration. So I find those things challenging. I think as a director, I find it challenging um, when I'm inherited cast, when I inherit casting, because those worlds don't look the way that I imagine those plays to be. My world is very plural. 
And so when I inherit casting that does not look like that, I'm now at odds with the piece that I'm working at because it's not the same piece all of a sudden. Um, artistic directors with their favorites that they like to present to you, that they like to present to you very hard and you're just like, I see it in a different place. Those are challenges for me. Um, also, uh, working with people assisting in casting who don't understand the nuances within races or within race, racial experiences or, or different communities, not just of race, whether it be of shade, of size, of accent, of all of these different things, and having people present me with um, inappropriate casting, and I'm just like, you don't understand the community, or you haven't read the play, and all working at a disservice for the play. I find diversity so challenging because it centers the people who I don't, who are centered in the world that I live in, but they are not centered in the way that I imagine the world. They are there, but they're not centered in it. So I find it very challenging because in my world, that is, that's odd. That, that a minority of the world is taking up a majority of the space in my place, in my place and that, or in the way that I imagine them. So that's very challenging. And the little story that I will share, which gave me so much joy was when I was in grade three at Maple Leaf Elementary School, Ms. McCrory, rest in peace, she did Goldilocks and the Three Bears. We had an audition, you know, your girl showed up. My mama gave me ringlets, like slept with it in rags, you know what I mean? Put a little pomade on it so it wouldn't get too frizzy. And I went and sang and skipped my little took us off. And I got the part. And my teacher cast me as it. No golden wig. You're just called Goldilocks. It's fine. Put your hair in ringlets. Say, that's great. So apparently my parents took the day off of work or the morning and came to the assembly, watched me do my thing. And only later they shared this story because they were just like, our daughter doesn't need to learn that today. She just needs to have fun today. And my parents said, well, you need to understand all the titterings that go on because you need to understand the world that you're going to work in. Parents going like, well, how was she cast? Why was she cast? Why would they do this? And they're like, we didn't need to ladle you with that, laden you with that. They're like, you just need to skip. My point being, especially because we're speaking with a lot of educators and or people in power, is that Ms. McCrory, when I was in grade three, set me up for success because she was someone who saw me for who I was and just gave me the part because I did the part. And then I was, have been, and I, you know, it's what it is, but I will always have to fight for it. But that one person who was actually the first person who told me that I, as long as I was excellent, that I should be seen for that and evaluated on that, and that there was room for parts to be blown open, to be reimagined with new people, even if it wasn't conceived with them. That was my experience. And that has set me up for this journey that I'm on right now and why I seek um, being in positions of influence in art because I wanna be that person for any and everybody. Yeah, so that's me. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for sharing. Um, each of you has, has touched upon um, some of the experiences that you've had in your careers um, with casting. And uh, the next question that we're going to ask you is about, based on your observation of casting practices um, in Canada, would you say that discrimination is different um, in institutions versus the professional world? Um, and if so, uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, so is, is casting, the discrimination that's observed in, in casting, is that different in institutions than it is in the professional world? And if so, can you speak to that a little bit? Just want to clarify institutions, meaning training institutions? Yeah, educational institutions, that's right, yeah. You just go right for the jugular, right? Like, there's no skirting around this conversation. Let's just get right to it. <laughs> that's right, yep. <laughs> when you understand, or when crap. people understand 
that the three pillars of Western society are predicated on bigotry, then they will begin to understand what the problem really is. You have education, religion, and the justice system. They are all built upon bigotry, prejudice, that's a fact. And no matter what you're dealing with, unless you come, unless you know you're going to have to come to grips with that understanding, what we end up doing is having conversations like this every 10, 15, certainly every generation. And why do we keep having those conversations? Because that which exists above us, like the master puppeteer, keeps us having these conversations. Someone, I don't know who it was that they said that word, uh, revolutionary. There it is in a nutshell. Unless you go from reactionary to revolutionary, you will have these conversations every generation. That's a fact. And the reason that they are so, they meaning the above group of the overlords, maintain this thing that we are going through now is because they don't have the conversation. They make sure that we have the conversation. And as long as we're talking, they have nothing to worry about. That's how I see it. And I say that for this reason too. But in my own particular career, if you will, I had to decide at a very early time exactly what path I was going down. And so when I can say at this stage in my life that it has always been a parallel path, my careers, the artistic and the activist, they went hand in hand. I had really no choice because I come from a people of, of activists. Very much so. And I, I associated myself with activists, the, you know, great activists of the day, who I was lucky enough to meet, and who were there to mentor me. Because I, being in Nova Scotia, was in a very particular spot. I had no one there. Um, who was involved in this same thing that I, I was involved in. I had the activist side. I came out of that. But the artistic side, there were years when I was the only professional Black actor east of Montreal. So I had to decide whether or not, because of my activism, I was going to concentrate on me or whether I was going to do something so that the ones coming right after me did not have to go through this. And so I, I did that, not because I was anything special, but because my mind was wired that way. And so while I was forging, uh, trying to forge an artistic path, I was deeply, deeply involved in the, 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 the uh, uh, activist path. And I used one to propel the other. Um, most of the time when I ran up against things in the artistic world, which, <clears throat> in a, you know, I don't know about now, but certainly then, many artists or people in the artistic world, <clears throat> they really didn't think that. <clears throat> by and large, 
the uh, things that confronted them were that deeply connected with the things that confronted people outside of the bubble. And of course, being involved in activism and therefore knowing all the machinations of government and all that kind of thing and what they wielded over the arts and how they do it uh, and also over education and uh, all the things that impact upon the individual, the artist, as well as anybody else, got a schooling in all that. So that I knew that when I went over into the artistic world, I looked at it primarily as if I were outside of the bubble. And lots of times I had to just keep my mouth shut and keep on with keeping on because being in that world outside of the bubble that I call it, the activist world, taught me things that really were very difficult to get over to people in the artistic bubble. But I had to forge on. And my main thing was making sure, again, I say that those who were coming behind me, right behind me, were well aware of what I was finding out. And, as, and especially those who were going to move into the artistic world. So, um, it's always on my mind, always on my mind, uh, the, uh, the understanding of who is in control and how they are in control and how they will take that control and make sure that it, it is uh, it, you know, well taken care of by doing just enough to titillate and um, give a bit of hope to those who are you know, busy trying to change things. And then every, if you watch very carefully, very carefully, unless you're dealing with someone or someones who really know the game, not just the words, not just the slogans, but who know the game. They know how people who are standing right next beside them and who were in the trenches with them suddenly are moving out of the trenches, moving up because the one thing that the overlords kind of depend on is, uh, okay, let's watch it very carefully and figure out just what their price is. Always figuring out what the price is. And it takes someone or someones who are already committed to going the full length of the journey without any compromise. The ones who have no price. And we all say we have no price. But that's not what we tell ourselves at three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning when we're being honest. It's a hard road. It's a hard road. And I think, Jenny, you said it right. We're going for the jugular here. <laughs> That's <clears throat> pretty much it, right? It's yeah. we're, we're dealing with a generation that maybe we can get the message out sooner than it used to be, right? That the, these, these conversations are happening in the institutions rather than in the professional world when it's too late. Mm -hmm. Well, I find it an interesting conversation for a few reasons, and that because I both work within an, a training institution and have history with many training work institutions and also work in, in the industry. Um, so uh, here's my thoughts currently. Because of all the work that people, the conversation has shifted 
because of George Floyd, because of those children at the residential school graves that were that have been uncovered for years. It's just that now we're hearing about it in the news. Uh, because of all of those circumstances, the conversation is moving forward. Um, it's taken 70 years, as Walter has said, but the conversation is moving forward. So where do we find ourselves now? There are similarities and yet differences for me in, in regards to the uh, training institutions and the industry that we have. And for me, it stems with the expectation that all of us sitting in this room together know how to get along. Because we've always, always been put together as the group of other. And we share, we do share a common experience. And so therefore, you know, these panels and the places that we find ourselves in, um, we do share the history and the understanding of that, which is great. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we know how to navigate the circumstances and current things that we're finding ourselves around in terms of the conversation. For, so for example, with casting in training institutions, you have institutions that are trying to do the right thing. You know, they're bringing in wonderful scripts from people of color. But what are people of color writing about? People are people of color writing about the experiences that we've had. <laughs> and so the, the texts that are finding their ways into our training institutions are one that are inherently including uh, trauma, oppression, history, so then we're in a room where mm, the makeup of the class may be, I don't know, maybe there's one black student and the play is about a black family. So then what, what do you do in the casting? How do you navigate that? Um, how do you break it down in a training institution where your class makeup um, brings up words like, can we do this? Is it appropriation for a non-black person to play a black person? Is it appropriation for a non-indigenous person to play a black person? Is it okay still, or is it still okay for a white actor to play a black person? These are the conversations that are happening right now within institutions, and it's complicated. It's complicated for many reasons. One, because we haven't had enough time to understand what that word reconciliation really means. And I don't mean reconciliation just between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. I mean reconciliation around all of us who come together to have these conversations. So Jill Carter at U of T uses the word conciliation, and I love that. I love that word as opposed to reconciliation because conciliation is the action of mediating between two potential disputing groups or people. So potent, I say potential because suddenly we're in a room where the idea maybe of sexual intimacy is first and foremost in our thoughts when we navigate uh, difficult material, especially in the training room, but also in the industry. But we haven't had enough time to look at the idea or the concept of cultural intimacy. We don't know how to navigate those scripts together in the room when we're trying to unpack what's in it, when we're trying to look at the fact that suddenly we have a script and we have still maybe a predominantly white uh, group of acting students who are then trying to deal with a, a beautifully written play by an indigenous woman who is unpacking racial biases and and trauma and there's there's a, a, a real challenge in terms of unpacking what I'm calling cultural intimacy. And these are the circumstances that we're finding now within our training institutions that it's great that we're navigating this, but it's it's fast. It's like, oh, wait a minute, we just programmed this great play, but we didn't think about what it would need mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of the support for everybody involved, not just the students, but the faculty who is then suddenly going, well, do I have the resources? Do I have the understanding to have these conversations around cultural intimacy? Do, do I have the, the, the understanding of how to navigate a group of 10, 20, 30 students in a room trying to have this conversation about, because we haven't ever really had 
about the history of this country together outside of the classroom and how it pertains I think to um, the industry it's getting I think it's getting there and those conversations are happening but it also going back to what Walter says it depends on who's in charge and I'm just so thankful that we are finally seeing some mm-hmm. amazing women of color uh, primarily in, and and also men of color in positions of power in positions of leadership because not only will they be tasked with um, you know continuing to develop new material but also and continuing to bring in fabulous plays that have been around for years that have sometimes never been produced but they'll have a better understanding of how then we address this idea of cultural intimacy. How do we get along in the rehearsal hall? How do we navigate multicultural casts? How do we, how do we all figure it out together in the room when all of us have, coming from different cultural backgrounds, have had different oppressive experiences? Um, sure, we have the, you know, the common thread of all, all having experienced it, in our histories, but do we really understand what it what it means to go through the other person's uh, uh, walk a mile in their in their shoes? Not not necessarily, not really. These are the things that we're now having to do for ourselves, and we have to do it fast, because the students that are currently in institutions and the plays that are being brought into um, uh, some some of the more progressive. Uh, theater companies are going to require our casts and our directors and our stage managers to understand how to navigate that relationship of concili- conciliation. So I, I find it, I feel like I'm not prepared for what I'm dealing with right now. And I'm racing to, to figure out how to best support the needs of the students, the needs of the actors that I'm directing and I'm trying to inform myself as much as possible and train myself quickly in how to deal with these particular issues. Just to end off, because I don't want, I've taken up a lot of time and my apologies, there's just so many great people on this panel, but I feel, this is my personal opinion, and I understand that people disagree with me, but I feel the training institution is the place to play multitudes of characters that are not based on culture. And my argument is primarily that because white is also not a culture. And so I want to play a Dane. I want to do Hamlet, man. (laughs) I want to play a Lear, goddammit. You know, I think I should. I think I'd be pretty good at it. Well, at least not Hamlet. I'm maybe too old for that. But Lear, I'm like, yeah, why not, right? But I, I, I think the training environment is a time when we should be allowing ourselves to understand in an, in an opportunity of empathy to really understand what it is to play those other cultural races, which is not going to happen in the industry. So that's... Yes. That's my personal opinion. It's a great opportunity in the training situations to just explore and understand each other better through art, through the work, through art, right? Not a freaking, I love these panels. I'm not saying that, not another panel. Through the art, go to the play, explore the play, put it in your body, embody being those characters and understand what that means, right? For all actors. Whew, I'm, I'm a little over passionate about this. I'll pass it on. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. Who, that's Thank what you. we expected. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I heard the opportunity of empathy, and I have written that one down, started, circled, and I'm taking it with me. Carmen, you had your hand up. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for that, Jenny. I, I agree with every word you say. Um, uh, a few years ago, I was invited back to my alma mater, um, Studio 58, here in, in Vancouver to direct my play, The Refugee Hotel, uh, which has never been produced in Vancouver, even though it takes place in Vancouver. (laughs) And it was written, I don't even remember when, like 20 years ago. Um, uh, Here's the thing, that that script uh, features, I don't remember how many characters, 11 or 12. And I think eight of them are uh, Chilean refugees. Um, 
and of course the 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 students that I was given to work with on this play who were all fabulous I think they were all white except for one one person there might have been two people of color but other than that it was like 12 uh, I think a cast of 12 I, I don't remember anyway they were almost all white uh, and of course they were there was a lot of nervousness about this you know uh, from the students themselves like we're not Chilean we're not like Latinx, what the hell are we doing? Are we going to be like destroyed? Are people going to hate us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I love this term that you have shared with us, Jani, cultural intimacy. I'm going to, I'm going to use it from now on. Uh, so what, what I found, and uh, because I was directing it, uh, um, I found uh, ways um, to approach the material with them in ways that would make them comfortable inhabiting these characters. And so, you know, we had the conversation out in the open. What is the experience of inhabiting a Latinx character when you're not Latinx? Let's talk about that, right? Uh, and we landed on witnessing, right? That they felt really, they started to feel really comfortable uh, playing these characters when they uh, looked at that e exercise through the lens of I'm witnessing these characters and I'm holding space for them as I inhabit, as I inhabit them. Um, needless to say, I mean, the work they did was glorious. And there is one thing I want to, I could go on about this for a very long time, but I don't want to take up too much more time. Uh, there is one thing that I want to say is that, yes, I agree, Jani, that um, theater school is exactly where we, where we should be doing all of this. You know, like Lin-Manuel Miranda, he gave the rights to his uh, musical In the Heights to a bunch of universities in the United States. And he said to them, look, um, I don't care that you're not all Latinx. Uh, you're not gonna have the opportunity to play Latinx characters if you're a white person once you graduate. And I think it's very important that you understand uh, at least something of the Latinx experience in the United States by inhabiting these characters and telling these stories. So it's important that you do that. But I, what I would like to point out is that um, I would like to point out that where we are right now is not the ultimate goal in my view. You know, my vision is that someday, hopefully sooner than later, we are all playing everything out in the real world, not just in theater schools. Uh, am I suggesting that white people should be playing Othello? Of course not, right? Uh, I don't know what it looks like, but I know that I don't want segregation. I don't want ghettoization. Uh, I don't want literal casting, like, oh, I can only play Latina women, women and another woman who's not Latina cannot play a Latina. No, I don't want that. You know, that's where we are right now. And we need to be there right now. We need to be there right now for all the reasons that everybody on this panel who's been around for decades has explained, right? And we've been fighting and fighting and fighting and struggling in order to get to this place. But this place is just another step towards my point of view, which is the ultimate vision and ultimate goal that we all play everything, whether that's 100, 200, 300, or 20 years away, I don't know. You know, but I just want to point out, I do not believe that the ultimate goal is that we continue to have forever the Black Theater Company, the Indigenous Theater Company, the Latinx Theater Company that, no. That, that's, that's uh, to, for me, that's not the ultimate goal. This is where we are now. We need to be there right now. It can't be the end, uh, the end point. Yeah, thank you, Carmen. I would like to take from that and then another provocation. I mean, as a playwright, I have never thought of an identity. I just write human beings. Uh, Latinx means really very little to, for me because I don't even know what that is. I'm a Colombian woman. If I'm anything, I'm Colombian. So I'm not from any other country in Latin America. And the stories that I have written are human stories. I don't care who plays them. They're about a human being in these circumstances. Uh, I agree that these are the conversations that we need to, to have now. And I really wish that we get out of these boxes. What I want to the provocation now, and I think it does relate to casting, is that in all these changes, we've been talking about institutions and the big theaters as if that is the ultimate goal. And I am a grassroots and independent theater, theater maker, and I will be until the end of time, and I'm not interested in being in any of those big theaters, not 
interested. So for me, that now the thing is that we all had to aspire to that, then you're taking away the freedom to be an artist because large institutions will never be political. They cannot be political. You cannot respond to with a performance action that needs to, to respond in a moment where we need a, the artist to respond if you need to apply for a grant and when three years to produce a play that's going to cost $150,000. For God's sake, the world, the people around the world are being killed. And if every, if you think the arts change by waiting until you're spending thousands of dollars to act as an artist, then we're dead. Then why are we here as artists? So as much as I respect all these things, I really want to advocate for the independent community who has been working with diversity, where it's all where diversity has been able to exist for decades without these small theater companies that still get no funding from our government, hardly any funding. Like people come and say, Aluna Theater has money. I say, Aluna Theater has money for fuck's sake. I'm the only full-time employee of a company of 20 years who runs a, an international festival, who has another festival, who produces, who supports a community. So, so that's where the problem starts. Like theater is not all the same. We all make different kinds of theater. Like when I say theater and it's all one kind, for God's sake, where is this coming from? Like theater is many things, you know, there's entertainment, there's this, there's that, and you choose where you want to position yourself. You, I mean, I can only speak for myself and where I come to life. I come to life when I see all the things that people don't want to do and we say, let's put them on because we got nothing to lose. Because you cannot tell me that what I do, you don't like it, that's your thing, but there's some other people who like it. I'm not afraid with, to work with that with a refugee who just arrived in Canada and who hardly speaks English because they can act better than anybody else because their body is acting. So these are the things that I need to protect and I get very passionate now because in all this year, I've been in all this, not this particular panel, but in panels and I go to my colleagues with all due respect, I don't want to be in your theater. You think I'm waiting for you to give me the position to be there. I love my tiny Aluna and I will die for Aluna. And I will die for the artists that we have been supporting throughout the years. That's where I am at home. And so uh, I, 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 when this talk now that we have to change and who is changing, like uh, Walter mentioned, who is in power now? And who is like, you know, moving us, moving us now to have the conversation, to have the fights because they love to put the communities against each other. Like, and while they wash their hands, uh, you know, so in, in the, you know, last year rushing to give companies to people with no experience, like, you know, like, as, as, a, as an artistic director, as a director, I love working. I always had people in my place called quote actors. I bring interesting people to the stage, you know, working along other, that's, I come from uh, collective creation, not, not divisive, you know, you know it not, and not, uh, what is it? Collective creation, like from Santiago Garcia, is a way of life. It's a way of thinking about the world. So, uh, I bring those people in and I take those chances. And then, you know, I don't want that to be lost because that's where things are really happening. The change, who started the change? Who started having diversity? Was it the big institutions? No, it has been all of us who have been fighting and fighting and fighting and supporting the artists and supporting the work. So now they come and they want to possess it. Come, you know, I, I, as a director, I would never put somebody who doesn't have, I would, my role as a director is always see where that person is gonna shine. So I'm not gonna give an institution to somebody who is not ready for it, not because they're not great and have the potential, but my, maybe is that the solution? Maybe that person is better running something in a place that needs that person and all their energy to, to build the community. Okay, I think I should stop because I get very passionate, but I do want to advocate for independent theater because the solution for me, I'm tired of these big institutions, tired. And not everybody has to go to an institution to become a great artist. That's something I really should add as well because many actors, many great artists around the world 
had been rejected from institutions or have never wanted to go to institutions. So that is not the ultimate goal for me. Yes, Kim, <laughs> Kimberly. Oh, no, no, it's all good. It's like church or like temple. Isn't it? <laughs> Monday, I'm at, this is just coming to the fountain. Uh, uh, to what B was saying, the importance of cultural ecology. I'm interested in what all of us as theater makers, what's the discussion? Because I think we all have the thing that we do. Not every theater does everything for everybody. But what there is, is unfortunately, there's a commodification of what we do, which puts us in a quote competition, as opposed to the collaboration of creating a beautiful, uh, artistic ecology in which we all could exist and do good work. And speaking from working currently in one of the bigger institutions, I'm really interested in us using our leverage, meaning our resources and platforms in order to amplify uh, smaller, sexier uh, theaters to help them do their work, which means just, we don't wanna be a part of it. We're not trying to impose anything, but here are some resources, here's a theater, here's some space, what do you need and I'm I'm interested in what those kinds of relationships are because the greatest plurality does not exist in these organizations and institutions in fact they're built on exclusion so in order to actually earn the trust of the greater community and to also learn in a very gentle way of how to do it better there is that assistance and there is that gentle sort of community bridge building to those people who are in practice of doing it beautifully to be able to amplify their work. And then if those bridges are built successfully, how to do it, how to assist, how to help, how to participate in all those different things. I think, um, Carmen, when you were speaking about no boxes, I too agree with both yourself and Jani, but I think especially what it is, it's about how do organizations and uh, theaters get that cultural fluency throughout the whole organization in order to support that kind of work? Because we can have those conversations in rehearsal halls, We can, but if we can't have them also with um, administration, if we can't have them in marketing, if we can't have them in production, if we can't have them with volunteers, if we can't have them with front of house, if we cannot speak this language throughout a whole organization, all we are doing is setting up this beautiful artistic work for harm within the organization, let alone before we share it. So I'm really interested in that. But what I, I have seen from the outside, because I don't get to participate too much in training institutions right now, other than just guest teaching, which is amazing, but I'm just not there enough, is that I used to see more creativity and flex in casting in, organize, in, in training institutions. And now I see less in service of trying to prepare the students for what is, as opposed to trying to train them for what they could be. So opening up the canon, opening up the canon, I mean canon of the world of theater, of devised in print, oral of all these different things, opening up the canon to all students will create the most exemplary artist ready for their next career step. And right now it seems that we're limiting them. But at the same time too, I see these young pumpkin heads, I call them pumpkin heads endearingly. I see these young students coming out who are asking questions that they ask in their training institutions that the theaters, big theaters are not prepared to have. We're just like, oh, what do you mean? Are you using your voice? Are you questioning something that's happening? And that is awesome. So keep going, young people. If you're out there, keep on speaking, keep on doing all the things. I think, and I think that that too, that's what it was, you were saying, Jani, as well. So I just really, I think that playfulness of being able to support those artists for being then they're disruptive when they get into the rehearsal hall, which is the great thing. And that's where, the, you know what I mean? And they're good disruptions, they're good trouble. And I think that that's what setting um, young people up for training and being able to inhabit multiple bodies and bodies which are not necessarily their own experience is really important. And I think Walter in the end, when you are speaking about making sure that you can see the big picture, um, it is so important that as mirrors of the world, as artists, that we also understand the world in which we make our art. 
because it informs it. And I'll tell you, I had to do a political science degree because my parents, just like you were saying, Carmen, my parents said they did not come to this country for me to play roles of hookers and maids. And that's what they saw. They were like, if you become an artist, that's what that's going to be your trajectory. I was like, no, mom and dad, they're like, yeah, that, that's not what it's going to be. So they I did a political science degree only. And I only say that because I have never used my political science degree more than I have in pursuit of trying to make a living as a theater artist. And that when you see where we are in this moment right now, where we're at this critical point of this movement taking another step, you can also see the French Revolution again, where the revolution eats its young and you can almost see it getting ready to eat itself. And I'm wondering through these kinds of conversations and this, this um, discussion in trying to elevate our art, if we can actually get past it. Can we get past this pseudo division that the system likes to pretend and insinuate in there to divide us? Can we see it for what it is? Can we get together and through the act of art and creating more inclusive, dynamic, shit disturbing art, can we elevate this cause through the art, not separate from it? Anyways, you all are just breaking off all kinds of things for me and I love it. I'm so lucky to be here with you. Monday church. That's right. There it is. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, everybody. Um, this conversation, it's been incredible. Uh, you've pretty much all the questions that we have prepared are being answered in every single one of uh, these uh, conversations. So take up as much room as you need to, as much time and talk. Thank you. Um, with that, we do have time for some uh, question and answer. If anybody wants to uh, drop a question into the uh, a question and answer box, please do. And I see there are some there already and I'm just gonna open it up to the panelists, whoever wants to uh, take it on. Uh, but this one here, uh, um, how does the conversation about cultural intimacy and witnessing, how does it go with the conversation about gatekeeping culture, especially with black American culture? So how does the conversation about cultural intimacy and witnessing go with the conversation about gatekeeping culture, especially with Black American culture? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got uh, about 15 minutes, so <laughs> here we go. Certainly my understanding of cultural gatekeeping is, is that as Walter was talking about the relationship of, of of leadership and the, and the relationship of people, those people in power. And I, for me, the cult, the, um, for me, cultural ad, uh, uh, intimacy is, it is the conversation that happens in the room when, when you're making the art, when, when you're trying to figure out as actors, directors, stage managers, working together, um, how you're going to navigate the incredibly rich, beautiful, complex content of the plays that you're doing. So um, to me, that's what I define as, as how do cultural intimacy, how are, we, how are we able to address the historical inequities within the art, but also outside the art, because all of our experiences are, are complicated and different and we're asked to come in and, and we're asked to do this incredible work um, together. For me, the cultural gatekeepers um, need to understand the importance of making space for that conversation to happen with the people in the room doing the art. And so uh, I, I can't speak directly to how it relates to uh, black, um, black culture, but I, I can, for me, it's really about a conversation about the, the cultural gatekeepers, the people who are, are, are who, you know, con controlling the purse strings in in some uh, uh, in some ways, have to understand that the work can't happen unless we are allowed to have space for those for those conversations in the room. The work will be better. The art will be better if we understand that that conversation has to take place throughout the rehearsal process my two cents this conversation is a very a very necessary one the the, the uh gatekeeping and uh it's a biggie you see 
I, I, I certainly can understand um, when, for instance, uh, since they talked about, you know, with black institutions, if it is only now that, and this will apply to other peoples too, but I'll speak from black perspective. If it is only now that you're being recognized for who you are, for what you have done, then they say, well, give me a minute, if you please, to absorb that. All right? It's my right. While on the other hand, the the need for people to understand. I say, I want you to understand me. So if I allow you to put my words in your mouth, will that help you to understand me? And I think that should be allowed. You see, it all, it's all about teaching, teaching. I'm a teacher. And I, 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 I form my lesson plan. So my lesson plan for today here is to accommodate the class in gatekeeping. I understand that. But I also go to my next classroom and my lesson plan is about the, if you will, appropriating for a particular reason, because I want you to understand something. It is all in the hands of the teachers. It is all in the hands of the teachers. Huh. What kind of a teacher are you? You define that. I live by these words. I learned them from Lorraine Hensbury many years ago. I've kept it. Lorraine said, the why of why we are here is an intrigue for adolescents. The how must command the living. And that is why I have lately become an insurgent again. So I have to define my how, my how, how am I here? And if I know that, then I know how to pass on to someone so that they can define how they are here, not why they are here. If you define your how and you live through your how, your why becomes self-evident. How am I here? And I really think that everything that we have talked about today demands, after all the rhetoric, after everything, just the defining our how, our personal how, independent of anybody else, everything else, my how, how am I here? That's where I am. I like that space to breathe. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question from the uh, audience, uh, Dante, if you want to. Yeah, for sure. Um, how can we as artists be the ones in control? How can we take away the power of the overlords? By defining your how. <laughs> <laughs> yes, by defining your how. <laughs> I mean, I think that we've already kind of said it, right? Uh, Bea certainly spoke about it very beautifully. You create your own work mm -hmm. and uh, you you figure it out, you know? And, um, you know, Bea didn't get to where she is with Aluna um, easily, 
you know? So what I mean by that is that all of us who create our own work, we start with nothing, <laughs> you know? Like if you have to do it in your own living room and invite <laughs> friends and they invite friends and then they invite friends and then somebody offers their living room, that's what you do. Um, you, you never wait for the phone to ring because it never will. <laughs> And if it ever does, it's going to be to play the hooker and the maid. Um, it, it is, right? Uh, so you have to create your own work, you know, and you have to, um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you just don't, uh, um, how do you say that? You keep your integrity, you know, like I'm, I'm uh, a person who has written whatever the fuck I want. You know, I'm not sitting here writing going, oh, I wonder if Stratford will do it. Oh, I wonder if the regionals will do it. They, they will never do it. They will never, ever, ever do it. Not only because it's about uh, poor Latinx people who are not performing gratitude to the dominant culture of Canada for letting us in, but because it's left wing. My work is very left wing. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you just keep doing it and eventually Somebody might come and say to you, hey, I want to produce your play. Or, hey, I want to hire you to play a part that's actually not a dehumanizing racist stereotype. Um, but that comes after decades of doing your own work and keeping your integrity and um, knowing what you're, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, and who you're doing it for. You know, I know that I was never writing to this day. I don't write for you know um the season's tickets holders at the regional theaters across canada if they want to come that's wonderful i write for my community that's who i write for so i don't know if i'm answering the question but um you create your own work that's how you stay in control of the work um and uh you have to know that uh it's going to be years of working for nothing of never paying yourself you know, all those grants that you apply for and that hopefully you get, that mm -hmm. little line in the budget that you put to pay yourself, it will mm -hmm. never happen. <laughs> you won't pay yourself for a very long time. Um, I could go on, but I, I think I'll stop there. Yes, Kimberly, you want to speak to that? If I could add, please, um, developing your practice and knowing what it is and letting it be dominant in your life knowing what it is, putting the time aside, knowing who you're training with, how you're training yourself, creating your work and making it a priority, uh, demystifying, um, having another source of income in order to live, demystifying it as that it doesn't make you an artist. It, it will keep you being an artist because being on your, your pay, you're on your own payroll. So it is helping you maintain your practice. So demystify that. That is somebody else's myth that is stopping you from taking that job that you need so that you can keep your practice. And because you're paying your bills then, and because your work is awesome, when you go into an audition, if you go into an audition for something else, you are auditioning them. It's a big mind shift, but you have to remember they're not not just auditioning you, you're auditioning them. Did they stand up to say hello? Do they have a big old table in between you and you just can't touch them through some invisible thing of glass? Did they come to the door? Did they try it three times? Do they speak to you properly? Do they engage with you properly? Do they ask the kind of questions you want to have? You snapped that audition them the way that they're auditioning you because that is real reciprocity. And you have to flip that, you have to flip that switch. And that's a practice and it won't happen right away, but keep on committing to it. And I think those are ways on top of what Carmen and B are saying in order to maintain your autonomy. I just I just love Walter the defining our personal how. I can only speak for myself. I recently realized that the only truth I know is my own. That doesn't work for other people, but there's the things I know. I love what I do. I have worked really hard and many times I have wanted to stop, but I love when I can give opportunities. And when I see artists that I can support and when I, I've seen parts of the world because of what I do, because somebody says, Bay, I cannot pay you, but we have a tent and we can go to South Africa and Zimbabwe and we're gonna do something. And I just go, yes. Okay, can you pay for the ticket halfway? Okay, sure. You know, like I have seen parts of the world because of theater. So I'm so grateful to theater. I love 
what I do. I love it. The, 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 the training, how you do the training, there's so many ways. Either you go into an institution. I hope I never stop training. I love studying. And I, I hope I never stop because, you know, that's my passion also trying to get, keep taking workshops here and there. So there's no one way, but what there is, is the commitment to what you do. That's the only, that's my personal thing. When I say yes, I, 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 I am in there until it. So, and I think that's what I have said yes to this company. And as much as I want to quit every day, I'm going to be there until the end. Yes. Yes. Uh, that, that's fabulous. We, um, I think we have time for one more uh, little question, perhaps. Um, there's a bunch of them here, which is great. Um, even at large institutions, there has traditionally only been roughly 100 hours for rehearsal. There are never enough hours to get there in quotations. Is there room for repertory theater with the delicacy that must be paid to respectful casting? I suppose in, in terms of time and, and energy. And uh, we, uh, just for time, it is a, uh, we've got about, you know, a couple, couple more minutes each and then uh, we'll wrap it up. But uh, yes, anybody want to take that one on in terms of taking the time to get to where we want to get to? Kimberly, yes, here in. I would say um, it would have to be a value. And if it's a value, then it becomes a priority. And if it's a priority and it's integral to the art, it's seen as such by whichever uh, company is supporting it, then they will make that happen. Or they should. <laughs> trying to find the quote, and because I can't remember who it's by, but it's a, by a Hungarian director who, who said, I'm paraphrasing, but something like, um, we have so little time, so we have to go really slowly. And, you know, to me, it's like, especially around the idea of content of the play, if the content of the play is this, is the, is the relationship, the complicated relationship of, of culture, then does that not feed the work and make it richer and deeper faster in the long run? Uh, I don't know if that's always true, but it's, it's something I contemplate as a director a lot when I go in just sometimes taking that extra half an hour off the top of the day just to have those discussions actually makes the work go <laughs> like really in a different kind of embodied way. I'll try to find that quote. <laughs> uh, all I, I would add to, I agree with both Kimberly and Jani, those, that's beautiful, um, is you know, uh, back to what Bea was saying earlier, where, you know, there are many ways to do theater. People do all kinds of different theater all over the world, and therefore they have completely different rehearsal practices as well. You know, so for example, I know that uh, the last time I was in Argentina, uh, and I have some very close theater friends in Argentina, you know, uh, but I, I, I'm sure it's still the same now but because I haven't had this conversation with my Argentinian friends for a few years, I'm not gonna say it's still the same now. I'm pretty sure it is. You uh, rehearse for up to two years, you know, uh, and then um, the pay structure has to, more to do with once the show is up, right? That's when you get paid well, right? Uh, for all your time, but you basically commit to rehearsing until it's done. <laughs> So you can rehearse for six months and literally up to two years. I have friends in Argentina who will rehearse for two years straight before they put the work out there. Uh, so there are many different models. And of course, that one is very different than what we do in English Canada. Um, but uh, just to put it out there, right, that there are different places all over the world that, that uh, do give themselves all kinds of time uh, to create the work. I just think that in Canada, for a long time, for many, many decades, we've been, we equated theater business model. So it's all about money. You're not rehearsing longer times because there's no more money or they don't want to pay more. Because really, when you think that there's a lot of money, there's never enough, a lot of money. So it's like four weeks in which you kill everybody by working 
eight hours, six days a week. You get to tech week, you're working 12 hours and then you open opening night. I really, to this day, I don't know how we make it to opening night. The actors have been going for, you know, endless hours and then you're supposed to be there, right? And present. And it's like, everything takes time just because you work more hours, but that's a very Puritan approach to life anyway. Work, 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 work. If you take half an hour to breathe, that's a crime. So, you know, doesn't mean because you you work 12 hours a day you're going to learn more than if you work three hours a day. Mm-hmm. so it's because we equate theater with business no theater in canada especially english canada works under a business model yep Yes, and the culture is Puritanism, like you said, Bea, right? The dominant culture of English Canada is Protestant liberalism, is Puritanism. It's not some neutral thing, right? It's, uh, it is a culture. It is, an, an, it is a very specific culture, and we can't forget that either. And it's a crime if you don't work the eight hours exactly. You cannot break a minute before the eighth hour. <laughs> Just a joke, just a joke. Okay, well, uh, we're almost at time. So uh, thank you all for, for, for being here and for, for answering these questions. Sorry to those of you that we, uh, we couldn't get to. Um, but at this point, we, we'd love to introduce everyone to the, rest of the, uh, to the rest of the team, the curation team. So if Mary Lowe, uh, Zoe, Marlies, and Cassandra can turn on your screens. Yes, many, uh, many people involved, uh, right, Dante, <laughs> to, to make this happen and to, to make this feel like home. Uh, what a, a wonderful discussion and conversation, which was the vision months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, we couldn't ask for more. This, this is, we're so grateful. Um, we want to thank uh, especially everyone who attended today, uh, all the participants. Um, and we do hope to see many of you at panel number two, which is this evening at six o'clock, um, where we'll have a, a conversation thinking about how we might embrace more inclusive casting presence practices uh, in the present. Um, and then our final one will be tomorrow, uh, June the 1st at 6 p.m. Um, speaking about the future and, and where we're headed in terms of, uh, of these conversations. And I feel like we've covered all those territories today, mm-hmm. some way, but uh, we certainly came from a, a place of legacy and, and uh, I, 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 I'm speechless, let's put it that way. And now it's time to figure out how to put this <laughs> into use and continue the conversation forward and and to make sure that the things that happened a year ago, they're happening now, they're gonna happen a year from now that we continue to to, to keep this this train running. Um, Thank you all. Uh, Yes, I can't say enough. Thank you. Wow. Just breathe.